sort of the whole thing was knocked together out of uh, aluminium and put together a bit like a giant Meccano set. And um, the camera, this little lightweight Bodex again, was just mounted onto this bit on the end here. And of course, um, because of all this bloody metal, I couldn't look through the lens at all. And um, all the crane shots were done by pointing the camera in the general direction of the actors and just hoping for the best. But if you use a wide-angle lens, you usually get away with that sort of thing. But sometimes, the camera must stay with the action. This is another bit of gear that I built for um, the film. It's called a Steadicam. And um, normally, if you buy a proper one, they're about 40 or 50 grand, but this one costs a, about 20 bucks. And it sort of works basically the same principle where you can move the camera around, follow people while they're running, and get more or less steady shots because it's a spring-loaded thing. Move around like this. It'll come up and down, in and out. And we use it for um, quite a few little shots in bad taste, and it seemed to help a little bit. The next big challenge was to come up with ideas for workable and cheap special effects to be used in the on-screen action. Well, the idea with most special effects, I reckon, is to keep them as simple as possible. And if you've got to have a machete going to somebody's head, it's easier to have a real person's head in a fake machete. So you knock something together like this with um, a bit of cardboard and some ice cream sticks to keep the whole thing reasonably rigid and there's a pipe for blood the little holes here that comes out it just fits nice and snugly like that <coughs> and um, we use quite a few simple little props like that there's another one here actually with a, a mallet that had to be whacked against somebody's head so um, just made a block of sponge you can whack it as hard as you like. Peter Jackson's ability to create realism at next to nothing cost also went into building an arsenal of weapons. Went a bit over the top because I did mechanisms that could work. All this sort of carry on. Um, the magazines are just made of wood and a bit of cardboard on top. And um, I just got a whole lot of aluminium tubing, like this bit here, and uh, drilled holes in it. And it's really held together by glue. It's not particularly strong. If you drop, dropped it on the concrete, it would probably shatter. And this is just a bit of FIMO, which is like plasticine for the handle. And uh, we just had to have the guy shaking these guns and make it look as if they're shooting. We superimposed flashes on the front. To an industry used to multi-million dollar budgets, these achievements might well be sickening. And the film went on to create its own on-screen nausea. Well, in the middle of Bad Taste, there's a scene where um, a guy is incredibly sick for a long time. And there's a character that's played by me, but I had to make a rubber head so that we could get the stuff coming out the mouth um, endlessly. So the way that we did that was um, I got a, this bowl of a dental... Um, stuff called alginate which they used to make molds of your teeth with but I filled a great big bowl with it and the stuff sits in about a minute so I took a deep breath and stuck my head in the bowl and then pulled it out again gasping for breath after a minute and I poured plaster of Paris in to get this effect here I had to have this expression on my face the whole time <laughs> and from this I was able to make a plaster mold negative mold and uh, we ended up with this which is um, the head, and it's a puppet. So the mouth goes. <laughs> He's got a funnel in the back of his head, so that the stuff can be poured down. The green guns can be poured through the funnel out the mouth, and Horror, science fiction, and splatter. The audience couldn't be sold short. We had to see the aliens in their true colours. <coughs> the 
this is the, the chief baddie in the film. He's made out of foam latex. Originally, you start off with a sculpture that's um, done out of plasticine. And the way that I sculpted this guy was I didn't have any sketches or designs because I never like working off of drawings or drawing drawings. I'm far prefer to work in three dimensions. So I just got this great lump of plasticine and started to sculpt. And um, after you've done the sculpture, you have to make a plaster of Paris mold. And in this case, it was in about five or six sections. And then that has to be filled with foam latex, which is like a creamy material that is whisked up in a cake mixer and poured into the molds, injected into them. And then it's got to be baked in the oven. And um, I had to use mum's oven for this, and it's only a normal household size. So this head was, the size of this head was determined by the, um, the size of the oven. And I managed to get it so that it could just squeeze in with about half an inch to spare, which is why he's got a, quite a flat top on his head. I'd have a menu mm. planned for the meal that night, you know, using the oven, and quite often we'd have to end up by having sausages or something under the grill because he'd want the oven for his baking. Mm. Mm. He used the oven a lot, and the whole kitchen actually used to take over to make his moulds. The latex moulds were laid over fibreglass with wires to control the lips and give the appearance of speech. You three, kill them. The rest of you.